We're really pleased this morning to welcome back Joe and Mark Hardman, and they are going to share about their lockdown breakout, discovering what's on their doorstep, really. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Joe, you probably remember that Joe gave a talk in July about cycling in the Hebrides. And so we're really, really pleased, Joe, that you've agreed to come back and do another talk for us. So over to you, Joe. So just as an introduction, last week, for those of you who are here, Alison took us to Africa. And in previous weeks, we've been in many other exotic and interesting places. Today, we are mostly going a few minutes from our door. We wanted to show you that in spite of the severe travel restrictions, there's still a lot to be gained, much of the things that travel gives us, with a bit of effort, even when you're actually close to home. We live very close to Elston Meadows, so much of our travel this year has been there. It's literally a few minutes from our front door. There have been occasions when we've been able to go a bit further afield, and we will be showing you some of those places as well. But just wanted to explain, when lockdown began a year ago, we went out for a walk on, on the first day on the meadows, just to clear our heads a bit after the news we'd been given. Although it was expected, yet it was still shocking in a way. Um, would have been more shocking if we'd known how long it was going to last. But we, while we were out, we determined that we would get out for fresh air and exercise every day that it was possible to do so. I think we've missed three to four days because of extreme weather conditions and one day waiting for a gas man who didn't turn up. Um, and we think we've been having a quick calculation. We will have just on these very short daily walks, we will have walked over a thousand miles. Um, so to start off with, Mark's going to give a, a brief history and description of our lovely meadows. Right. Mm. For most of our wanderings in the last year of lockdown, we have been in Elston Meadows, Meadows Nature Reserve and the surrounding farmland. It occupies a Saw Valley to the south of Leicester, where the River Saw is joined by the River Sense and Rubbersalt Brook to form a floodplain, which extends right into the centre of Leicester. Because the valley floods every winter, it has not been built upon but was left for hay meadows and summer grazing. But it has been exploited by city planners who have routed the Grand Union Canal, the Great Central Railway Line, as well as the electricity pylons, right through the area into the heart of the city. The, the reserve now also has a few small hills created for when it was used as the city's rubbish dump. You can still see the rubbish when, when badgers dig it out. Okay, so we started our walking in the spring, obviously. And at that time, we didn't need to put a lot of effort in. It was easy to find new things each day. You know, everything's just starting to grow. And, and photographing the progressing season, it was just easy. Went out every day and there was, oh, there's a new flower we didn't see yesterday. Things Very easy time of year to start off with. Although we, were, we are very familiar with Aylston Meadows, we did find there were some parts that we didn't know as well as we thought. So just a few of the initial flowers, obviously some daffodils and the white violets, which are out again now. And this one, which is a, a lovely comma butterfly. The butterflies and insects don't always cooperate, but on that occasion it did. So I was quite happy with that. We then also for a while were able to travel a little bit further. So in a minute, I'm going to pass you over to Mark again, because there's just a few pictures of a visit to Grace Dew Priory, which is one of my favorite places. I love to go there. Um, and Mark will tell you a little bit about the history. Grayskew Priory is situated near Shepshed. It was founded in, in 1239, home for 16 nuns, and it also had a hospital, 
for the benefit of nearby, of nearby towns. But despite this, it was dissolved in 1538 by Henry VIII. It was then used as a family home up until about 1730 and thereafter fell into disrepair. The grounds of the Priory are fascinating because it contained the remains of a canal and also a railway used to move coal from the Ashby coal field to the Saw Valley. The lumps and bumps and railway bridges left behind make a wonderful playground. In spring, the woods are carpeted with wild garlic and there is also a stream with stepping stones. It's a very peaceful place, which for me has the atmosphere of sadness surrounding it. Not ever so clear what they are, but all amongst the the undergrowth there, that is that slightly blue uh, colour is bluebells, and they're just everywhere. And again, I mean, we knew that there's a woody bit at the side of Grooby Pool, but we found that it extends back a lot further than people usually visit. And it's very peaceful and very beautiful. As it got a bit warmer, ice cream soon became a popular feature of our walks when it was available. This one was supplied by King's Lock Tea Room at the old lock keeper's cottage. They couldn't open the tea room, of course, but on a few days with a good weather forecast, they sold ice cream and drinks at the gate. When it became a bit chilly for ice cream later in the year, it was replaced with toasted tea cakes. But uh, we enjoyed the ice cream days while they lasted. Another picture of a, of a butterfly. This one's quite common on the meadows. It's an orange tip. Um, and I think it's a really pretty butterfly. We move into the time of year when the babies start to appear and these chicks were the first ones we saw on, on the canal. Little family of, of ducklings. As the seasons move on, the skies are becoming beautiful blue colour and fresh green leaves beginning to appear on the trees that you can just see against the um, background of the, of the, of the sky. The next few pictures, Mark's going to talk a bit about the, um, the history of some of the things to be found around the meadows. One of the main features of Aspen Meadows is the presence of the Grand Union Canal. By 1794, the River Saw had been dredged and made navigable from where it joined the Trent as far as Leicester. In 1797, it was decided to extend the canal from Leicester to join the Grand Union Canal and thereby reach London. Aylston Meadows was the obvious route, but it was not until 1814 that the link was finally made. The canal was started with plenty of enthusiasm and money, with wide locks and bridges that could accommodate boats up to 14 foot wide. But by the time the work had reached Foxton Locks, the money was running out, so these locks were built to take boats only up to eight foot wide, and the larger boats were never used. The canal company built eight bridges in the Aylston area, all brick built and all of the same humpback design. This one is an Aylston mill. Notice the strange shape of a curve. It's not semicircular as you might expect, but rather elongated. This is because the left hand side of the bridge suffers from subsidence and has been repaired many times over the years. This time it was closed again for, for, for further repairs. This is, this is the under repair because they found great big cracks in the brickwork. The car park is on the far side of the bridge, so it gets quite a lot of car traffic. And I suspect this is probably making the subsidence worse. There isn't much archeology span to find on Elston Meadows because it was never built upon, but you can find a few things. This is a picture, a part of the bridge, and you can see a rope mark in the, in the middle of the screen. These date from the time when horse-drawn boats dragged the, the, the barges up, up the canal, and, and the tow ropes rubbed against the brickwork. Apparently, tow ropes had to be, had to be changed every, every month, because they wore out so fast.
This attractive footpath leads from, from Elston Meadows down to St Mary's Mill. The path has had its own five minutes of fame a few years ago because one of the willows growing alongside turned out to be a very rare hybrid. A picture of it even appeared in the Daily Mail. This is St Mary's Mill. This is one of the most important pieces of Leicester's industrial heritage. There has been a water bill on the site ever since 1100. In 1790, it was converted into a water powered hosiery mill. And then in 1830, changed to a rubber factory. Most of the buildings you can see in the picture date from around 1830. Eventually, the factory was taken over by Dunlop and it was finally closed in 1971. During the Second World War, the mill made aircraft parts and so became a target for German bombing. All the bombs missed, but hit the nearby gas works and nearby Cavendish Road. There is no trace left of the original mill building. Oh, can you go back a bit? Go back one, sorry. But if you look in the middle of the picture, you can see a, a black mark which indicates where the mill leap leaves the canal and runs through the buildings to power the water wheel. The estate was due to be demolished for housing a few years ago, but has since been reprieved and it has been renamed Fairchild Industrial Estate. This is home to about 21 businesses employing 200 people. One of my sources has described St Mary's as the most beautiful industrial estate in the world. I wouldn't agree with him, but I can see his point. Although it's scruffy and uncared for, it does have a charm all of its own. There is even a small branch of the river winding its way through the building. I think with sympathetic restoration, it would be a lovely place to live and work. You can just see the river at the bottom of the screen there as it runs through the building. Elton Meadows was also chosen as the route of the Great Central Railway. This ran from London to Sheffield, and its claim to fame was it had the shortest life of any major railway in the country, opening in 1899 and closing in 1969. The route is now used as a cycle and, and footpath, thus Trans Route 6, which runs all the way from the Lake District to Oxford. The Leicester section runs for four miles from the city centre to Blaby. Originally, the railway ran through a deep cutting as it neared Leicester. But as you can see in this picture, the cutting has been filled up to the level of the bridges and the, car, and the path has been moved to, to, to go alongside the railway. This picture is, is of a lake by King's Lock. This lake only appears, to, appears in winter, so it's only seasonal. It's unusual because it's very straight. It's about 200 yards long and about 20 or 30 yards wide. A local historian believes that it could be part of a Roman canal, which used to run from, from, the, from the quarries at, in, in the Croft area, near Croft Hill, into the middle of Leicester and was used to transport the stone, which they used to build Leicester city walls. This is one of my favourite pictures. It shows what, 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 what the Ailes Meadows can be like in the middle of winter. It shows the towpath disappearing under, under the waters. And in, and in the middle of the winter, it's not unusual to, to, to be unable to walk in the area. I like, I like the sign by the Canal and River Trust, making life better. Okay, so we've reached the end of spring and moving into summer. The insects have become more common now. Only I seem to have lost the insects. There should be some bees and a ladybird. That pictures of Mark. Okay, I've got a slight... Um, discrepancy between my notes and the pic and the pictures. There's there they are. 
the bees and the ladybirds cooperated well for me to take pictures of them. But many other insects didn't. They were less obliging. But we saw many butterflies, dragonflies and other water insects. They just weren't obliging for the camera. But you could just sit at the side of the canal and watch the, the hundreds of, of um, dragonflies and similar. It was quite fascinating. The picture that I'd missed out was... Um, another one showing uh, some of our less strenuous activities on the menu, cups of tea. Absolutely essential, cup of tea and a snack on every walk. These ones are all in the sunshine and a bit later on you'll see some that weren't, but uh, we enjoyed that. So we start off with another day out away from the meadows, this time on Beacon Hill, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with. Um, the interesting carvings and the flowers, but it's, um, as I say, I'm sure everybody's familiar with it, but it, it makes for a very nice uh, afternoon walk. And this is still at Beacon Hill. Uh, you can see that it's it's summer now. We've moved on from the um, from the very pretty light pale yellow and white flowers. We're now on the strong, vibrant summer flowers, which are, as the couple here are, also some of my favourites. You might have guessed I've got a lot of favourites. This one is in Martin Shaw Wood, and I really like this picture because I've, I've got a bit of a thing about interesting tree trunks. And this one is obviously a fallen down tree, but it just like, looks like a great big hand that's pushed over a big clod of earth. Um, I just uh, think it's quite fascinating. Now, during the summer months, we had a little bit more freedom and either even even those of us living in Leicester could travel a little further and go to a few more things. Here's one very small event involving two streets in Bristol. Um, we only knew about it because a friend of ours was one of the participants. But they put on a display called Lockdown Art. Um, and they just had things, some of them for sale, some not, but in their front gardens for people to wander about and see. Um, which gave you a chance to say hello to a few people, which, you know, at that time, that was a bit of a novelty um, and we quite enjoyed it. As we were over that side, we moved on from there to Abbey Park. And this fungi here is called Chicken in the Woods. Um, it is edible. Um, they grow quite big. Um, and look quite interesting. I know our daughter's quite fond of eating them. And also, Abbey Park means another ice cream for Mark. Back at the meadows again. We followed this little family since the signets were very, very small until the days when they were quite forcibly and viciously evicted by their parents, which is the normal thing with swans. They look, they look all fluffy and sweet there, but they're really not. Um, and at this point, you can see that the, the, I think that's the male standing on the pavement. It was really scary walking past because, well, I'm scared of them. <laughs> um, and they let you know that they didn't want you there. But these, there were six signets at this point. But um, we learned that this chasing them off happens every year and it really is quite vicious. They chase off the male signets first and then shortly after the female signets before the next breeding season. Um, you know, that last year's signets must not be around. Um, we presume it's to stop inbreeding, that sort of thing. But they really do quite suddenly turn on them quite viciously. And if they don't go, they will kill them. Um, that was just a little something we learnt during, um, during lockdown. 
Um, but there, they're all looking quite sweet and innocent. One of the next flowers to come out is the yellow loose strife, there's also which is very, very common, mostly along the canal banks I found on the meadows. Um, there's also purple loose strife, which is also found on the meadows. Um, very pretty plant. And as I said, I like interesting tree trunks and I found that one quite interesting. They tend to show up more. I mean, this is summer, but they, they tend to show up more in winter, obviously, when there's not leaves around. That's one of the things I like to look at in the winter. Now, this one, we looked at those flowers nearly every time we went out. Um, you can't really tell from the picture, but there were there was a lot of poppies and a whole load of other things. But what made them interesting is they're on the very scruffy fork forecourt of a car testing place on Elston Road. And just along the side against this wall, there's this, this really beautiful display of semi wild flowers. I think they probably came from a package of wild flower seeds at some point where everything else is dirty and scruffy and they just stand out in the, in the environment that they're in. And I, I mean, now, you know, again, every time we walk past, I'm looking to see if there's anything appearing yet. There isn't quite yet. But, um, it just seems to make them more beautiful because the surroundings are so ugly. Another ship a little bit further afield. This picture gets mixed reactions when I show it to people. It's at Watermead Country Park. Um, people look at it and some of them go, yuck, horrible. And then I tell them that, as far as I can tell, they are um, the caterpillar of peacock butterflies. And then they change their reaction. Oh, <laughs> they're going to turn out into beautiful peacock butterflies. Uh, can't be 100% certain I'm right, but I think I am. Um, and they, they were living on the nettles there, and there was a whole area of nettles where every single nettle had as many caterpillars on as this. It was just covered in these caterpillars. Sometimes when we're on the meadows, we like to do our bit, clearing up, tidying up. It is an urban nature reserve, and not everybody remembers to take their rubbish away. Um, it's beautiful in many ways. There's a lot of wildlife, both plant and birds and animals. It's beautiful, but it is in the city. People do throw their rubbish, unfortunately. Um, on the plus side, it has a lot of regular visitors. Um, you know, an awful lot of people that we see and chat to over there, they're regulars, they're people we see not every time we're walking, but often. There's also, it has its own group called the Aylston Meadows Appreciation Society, which is both a physical group and there is a Facebook group. And they bring together a lot of those people. And there's a lot of volunteer work done by AMAS members and by other people who use the meadows regularly and just um, do it themselves. Uh, there, there is a big body of people that do their best to look after it and that was just our little bit picking up some rubbish which we do now and then while most events were cancelled last year this is one that wasn't um the reason it wasn't is because it's a small local event the cosby yarn bombing i don't know whether any of you have ever been to it it's on every year it lasts for a month, it's a small village event, and it's all outdoors. So all of those things make it pretty COVID safe, really. There aren't vast crowds because it's there for a month. Um, it's, there's just a few people wandering around. But I, it's something I definitely recommend looking out for. It's quite spectacular. Um, I've got one or two pictures of some of the things there. Um, as you come into the village, the bike, I think that's there most years. I think they, re they redress it, but that seems to be the first thing 
each time, has a theme each year. Um, it was um, stories, children's stories this year. So we have the owl and the pussy cat. I mean, that is a full size boat completely covered in knitting with everything in it is knitted. It was quite, quite spectacular. Uh, and we have Mr. Tickle. Um, Alice in Wonderland. Can you remove this cat mark? Oh, let me go back because that's the last one of those. One of the things I really like about it, now I've shown you pictures of some of the more spectacular things that there's an awful lot of work gone into, but it's a real community event. Anybody who lives in Cosby can take part. There's little things and the stuff's just displayed anywhere all over the village. Um, so, you know, there were things made by children and things made by various people who, you know, could never do this fancy stuff, but it's a community event. It's, it's for everybody. Um, and, and it is really interesting to see. It's, you know, maybe an hour or so, hour and a half, wandering around the village. We'll be going again this year. This is as far away as we got last year. We managed four nights away camping in the Hope Valley. It was, if you remember, there was a week that was very, very hot. Well, that was it. We were there that week. Um, it was a lovely campsite, but on one of the nights we were there, there was the most spectacular thunderstorm I have ever experienced, I think. Um, only one other I can remember like it. The thunder, it was very, very close. It was so close that when the thunder hit, you could quite literally feel the ground moving and the lightning was coming so fast one after the other that it at, at the height of the storm it was almost like it was daylight um and of course that's um accompanied by rain just coming down in absolute buckets uh, fortunately our tent is reassuringly expensive and doesn't leak um we were fine um, most people on the site were fine. There was a, a, a group of young lads who were hanging out all their bedding in the morning. Um, most people had only got a few bits and pieces to dry. Um, so not too much damage done, but it, it, was, it was quite scary. I mean, I'm not scared of thunderstorms, but that one was quite scary. But you know, when the ground is literally shaking, it's a bit scary. Um, and here on that same trip, this is Padley Gorge, um, which is part of the Longshore Estate in, in Derbyshire. Um, I really like Padley Gorge, it's really pretty. Now, as I said, it was really, really hot. We would have done more walking probably in other weather, but it was too, it was far too hot to, to do long walks or walks up big hills or anything. Um, but Padley Gorge was perfect for the weather. It's, it's, it's shady. Um, it was really nice and much as we love our meadows, it's completely different. So, you know, although it was only not so far away because we couldn't go far away, but it was, it was definitely a change um, and an area that, that we do love. Um, another thing we managed to do during the the little freedoms we had during the summer was we managed a day out with uh, um, National Trust in with our daughter and son-in-law and our baby grandson and this uh, this little chap lives in the garden at Cannons Ashby. Um, we had a nice, obviously we don't go outdoors but uh, we had a nice day there. Um, a couple more trips out. This is Blackbrook Reservoir on the left and Cross mm. Meadows on the right. Um, not very far away, but both a, a bit of a change. Different things to see. 
moving on in the summer, the early fruits are starting to appear. We started to see the, the sloes and the elderberries, both useful for making alcoholic beverages at some point. Now this one was, we were able to have our son stay with us because he's in our bubble. Um, doesn't happen very often because he lives in Aberdeen. Um, but this was while he was with us and he, he has some different kind of interests. <laughs> and he was interested in a particular style of gravestone that apparently only occurs in the Vale of Beaver some particular feature. It's not particularly our interest, but obviously he was with us, we took him. Um, and it's good, especially at times like this, when what you can do is limited. It was really good to actually be looking at something different to our usual sort of realm of what we would look at. So we, and there's lots of interesting things in graveyards anyway, but these are all around the Vale of Beaver and, and we, we really enjoyed that day. We went from place to place, we went to oh, four or five villages and it was really interesting. There was a lot of interesting history behind the things that he wanted to look at. Um, it was a great day. This was another special day because I think it's probably the only time since lockdown began, we had the whole family together on that day. Um, we, again, it's on the Longshore Estate in Derbyshire. Um, and we went for a day's walk with our son Samuel um, and our daughter, son-in-law and grandson. Um, this one is uh, Samuel making friends, making new friends on the route. I need to go back to my notes because I'm waffling on and missing bits. That's Mark having a little mini adventure. Looks like high cliffs, it really isn't. It's the rocks in Beacon Hill, but he's enjoying himself, so that's okay. Um, that's obviously a heron. Now we see herons regularly on Aylston Meadows, but I've never, never, very rarely managed to get them to stand still and have a photograph taken. I know when they do stand still, they do it for ages, but they're often too far away at that point. So this one's actually at Bradgate Park on, on the banks of the, of the River Lynn going through the park. Um, he behaved quite well while I took his picture. That's a different view of Bradgate Park. It was a, a hole in, uh, in a tree trunk and I just thought it was interesting looking through it. So we're moving on to autumn. New things start to come more slowly and it becomes harder to find things of interest. Whoops. It was during this time that I heard about the benefits of something called AWE, as A -W -E, walks. The basic idea is to look for and expect to see something interesting, no matter how unlikely that seems. It is to make walks purposeful. For me, that's mainly taken the form of always finding something to take a picture of. Sometimes when there aren't bright flowers and wildlife anywhere to see, be seen, you have to be a bit creative, but it really does make a huge difference to your, you know, your short local walks on a place that you know well. If you make a point of you going to find something. So, through the autumn, we'll have a look at some of the things that I found. Early on in the autumn, we went on a walk um, around Broadstone in Rutland and Brook. Um, I do have interest in that area because I have a lot of family history in, in Braunston. Um, normally, if we go in that way, there are people that I would hope to see, obviously, on this occasion, 
the aim was to avoid seeing them. Um, and, you know, our, on our walk, it was on little used footpaths. I don't think we actually saw anybody all day. I don't know what this fungi is, but we're moving into the season of, um, of fungi. Um, there were quite a lot on this walk and uh, well, I took that picture because I thought they looked nice, but I haven't found out what they are. We've obviously got the geese and, and the um, alpaca. But the spider, there was, because it's coming into autumn, there was quite a bit of dew on the grass. And on one area in particular, there was a, obviously a lot of spiders around that live at ground level because you could see the webs because they were covered in dew. You can see here that the, the web is, is quite visible. Um, so I found that quite fascinating. And here we move on to some of the fungi. I don't know what they all are. Um, the, one, the one on the um, the top right. Can move that cat, please. Sorry, we just need to move a cat. <laughs> um, that's a parasol. The one underneath it at the bottom is a turkey tail. And the one in the bottom left hand corner is a jelly ear. The other two, I don't know. Um, but it was quite surprising how we'd been looking out for the fungi because of it being the season for it. And it, that they weren't there. Um, and then just one day they were all there, everywhere, all sorts everywhere you looked. Um, they just sprung up out of nowhere. And so that became something to look for on our walk, seeing if we could find any new fungi. Something else we learned that we didn't know before. If you see a bottle like this in water, particularly um, with the lid on and string tied around underneath its lid, it's likely to be a marker for, for a crayfish trap. Now these have been a particular problem around Aylston Meadows because there was, it's going back some time, but there was a, a local incident when, um, that they are illegal anyway for whatever you're trying to trap, but an otter was found dead in one, um, which was very sad. So we saw this, it was right in the middle of the canal it was really difficult to reach. We thought we weren't going to be able to. We thought we were going to have to find somebody else who had an idea how to get to the middle of the canal. But then we found a um, very, very long, uh, basically a tree trunk, but a very thin one. With two of us, we could move it. Um, and we managed to pull it in. Um, and sure enough, here's the trap that it was attached to. Um, inside it are a whole load of empty cat food packets, but still with, you know, the, the smell and the waste of the cat food ar around it, which is what that is often used for bait. Um, hadn't caught anything, fortunately, um, and we, having got it out, we disposed of it. Um, but certainly particularly moving in as we move towards the summer, we will be looking out for bottles like that again. Now we know what they are. Even in the autumn, ice cream sometimes still feature. Sometimes the van's there and it's just too cold. And then on this one at the top, as you can see, it was absolutely throwing it down with rain. We drank our cup of tea sitting under a bridge, a bridge that's locally called Echo Bridge over the canal for obvious reasons. I think its proper name is something like 12 Arches, 12 Arches Bridge, something like that. Um, that was a very wet day, but we still went out and we still stopped for our cup of tea. We just had to sit on the towpath under the bridge for it. Right. Okay. Um, this is the swan family. They're now down to four. 
One of them disappeared. We don't know what happened to it, but there's there, there's four left here. They've obviously started the chasing off procedure. Mark's just reminded me that I probably need to speed up. So I just thought that was an interesting boat. It was very small. Um, so I, I don't know whether there's some special purpose for it, but it was colourful and interesting. And that's on the canal at Cosington. Also at Cosington, um, you can see that the bridge is, is exactly the same design as the ones more locally. Because uh, as Mark said, they were all built by the same people to the same design. And just leaving Cosington, um, the sun's just not quite sunset, but getting ready to set. Here we have Quenby Hall, which Mark will tell us a bit about the history of Quenby Hall. Mm. This beautiful house is Quenby Hall. It's, it's a Jacobean mansion built in about 1618. It's near the village of Hungerton. Now you might wonder why it's called Quenby Hall and not Hungerton Hall. The reason is that the landowner got rid of all of the peasants in the village of Quenby and knocked down all the houses. It is actually famous because it's a place where they developed the first Stilton cheese. And that was developed by the housekeeper, whose name was Elizabeth Scarborough. So it could be a relative of Tony and Liz, I'm not sure. Probably not. Um, recently, that they restarted the cheese making business in, in about 2005, but unfortunately it failed and left them with a lot of debt. So the house is now back on the market. And if, if you've got 11.3 million pounds, it, it can be yours. It's not open to the public, which is a shame because it's a beautiful house, but it is open for weddings. And if you wanted to get married there, it costs you £3,500 per day, which I didn't think was too bad for a large house. But the catch is that you have to use their catering facilities and their bar, so that would probably put the price, the price up quite a lot. It's also famous for having a large herd, 250 cattle, of the long horn variety. Unfortunately, we haven't got any pictures of those, have we? OK, while we're in Hungerton, this is a gate to nowhere, and I have looked to try and find out why it's like that, but I can't find anything. It's in the wall of Hungerton Churchyard, and I just thought that was quite interesting, the gate with the brick wall behind it. This picture isn't mine. Credit's due to a lady by the name of Janet Hambleton. The Kingfisher, we saw it a good distance away and in a very awkward place on a bridge and we didn't have proper cameras with us, only phones. And then we saw Janet. Janet is a regular on the meadows and has several feeding stations that she gets to on her mobility scooter. She feeds all the wildlife and buys specialist food for some of them. She also carries a good camera always and takes great pictures. So we asked her to take this one. There are so many birds that we've seen on the meadows and I don't have pictures of them because they don't cooperate. So, Grateful thanks to Janet for taking that one. This is another one of Janet's pictures. She feeds them as well. <laughs> um, and when I asked her permission to use the Kingfisher one, she said, oh, do you want my one with five rats on it as well? So, especially for Janet, I put that in. They're all scoffing her food. The signets are now down to three. There's another one gone. And we're moving on to winter. This is a book that Mark bought me. And it's really interesting and has lots of useful ideas um, for how you can get to see more wildlife, the things that are hidden that you know are there. Um, but what was, what took my fancy a lot uh, even more was the reasons for, for, for doing it. 
a short walk that's become all too familiar in, in recent times can become a bit boring, a bit of a chore really, especially when it's cold and there doesn't seem to be much more to see anymore. Or alternatively, it can be fascinating if you intentionally look for things of interest somehow and then set about learning about them. So we've learned lots of new things over this year. We've learned lots of new bird songs. We've learned what all sorts of things are or why they are, um, which we wouldn't have done otherwise. So um, one of the things that seemed to mark the early winter for us was the stunning skies. There was a spell in the winter where day after day the skies were just beautiful. So this is just looking out over part of the meadows and that site. Often the day had been dismal and damp. There were many days when the sun didn't put an appearance all day until literally minutes before it was due to set and then it would just appear and give us these amazing skies that were always very uplifting, especially at the end of a, of a fairly dismal day. So I chose that one, but I've got loads of pictures of those. Different weather conditions. This is in Aylston Hall Gardens, the frost on the, um, on the evergreens. And here we have a hungry squirrel in the, in the winter eating some of Janet's food that she's left out for them. And then after the frost came the floods. You can see the floods are quite substantial because it is a floodplain. Um, you can't cross it. Um, it floods most winters and this year was no exception. It does leave you limited as to where you can go because um, you know so many of the paths are blocked with the floods and also this year there's been a lot of work going on improving various things that have blocked some other paths so at times we've been very limited where we could actually go. This I just thought was funny. This is standing in the middle of deep, fast flowing flood water. I don't know what sort of cyclists they think are in there that need to dismount. Um, and the swans are now down to just the two of them. They chase the, all of the signets away now. Yeah, I can see we're about to run out of time. I should just about get to the end. Um, ice cream van, um, I think it's in Abbey Park, but now it's too cold. We didn't partake. More floods, you can see here how deep and how fast it's moving. This is a footpath which you obviously can't walk through. And then we got snow and some people had a lot of fun in the snow, didn't they, Mark? They did. Yes. <laughs> First time in years. Yeah. Um, the meadows was covered in, it became a little village of snowmen and it was really nice to see people, a lot of people, all ages, having fun making snowmen and snowballs. It was by no means all children. Um, just after a bit of a dismal time, it was just lovely to be seeing families having out having fun. And here, after the snow, we have the fog when you couldn't see down the, down the canal. But still, on some days, beautiful blue skies. This is ice that the interesting pattern has been formed by the ice being cracked, somebody standing on it or whatever, and then the water from underneath seeps up through the cracks and then it freezes again. Um, and it just makes these interesting patterns. So we had the big freeze as well. Oh, but the snowdrops survived through it all and just to finish it had to be a beautiful sky towards the end of the day looking out across a flooded horse field and that's us done yeah that was lovely joe and mark it's so nice you do admire your tenacity you've obviously gone out every day have you Despite Almost. Almost every day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um 
Yeah, it's fabulous. And we, and we all appreciate that we haven't, but pretty much everything.